Beloved, you will remember that Samson is a saviour. All of the judges are saviours. And Samson was sent by God and prepared by God to begin to deliver God's people from the oppression of the Philistines. In the previous chapter, Judges chapter 14, Samson had begun that deliverance. He had sought an occasion against the Philistines. Because, as we shall see again in chapter 15, God's people at this time lived in peace with the Philistines. That is to say, God's people seem to be content to buckle down under this oppression and do absolutely nothing (coughs) about it. But Samson was not willing or content to remain under Philistine oppression and he determined to do something about it. And so he sought an occasion against the Philistines, which means he sought a quarrel against the Philistines to end this false peace that existed between God's people and God's enemies. However, his methods were sinful because he married a Philistine woman. And at the end of chapter 14, the Philistines had shown their treacherous nature. Samson had killed several of them to answer the terms of a bet or a wager into which he had entered with these Philistines. His anger was kindled, we're told, at the end of chapter 14. And then... In chapter 14, verse 19, we read, He went up to his father's house, but Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. And now in chapter 15, Samson's anger has subsided, He returns to Timnath to seek reconciliation with his wife. He hopes to continue his marriage to this woman as if nothing had happened. And this too is sinful on Samson's part. Because Samson had no business seeking reconciliation with his Philistine wife. He ought to have put her away. That was the law of the Old Testament. When an Israelite would foolishly and sinfully marry a pagan woman, he was called to put that person away, to divorce that pagan. That's what he ought to have done, to have forgotten about her. But Samson's attempted reconciliation gives him another occasion to quarrel against the Philistines because they show again their base treachery against him. And this leads to an escalation of the war between Samson and the Philistines. And at the end of chapter 15, Samson is clearly the judge, deliverer, and saviour of Israel. He has shown that God has given him supernatural power to deliver Israel from the Philistines, and he is using that power to devastating effect. And now in chapter 15, the Philistines must know that there is indeed a God in Israel, And that this God in Israel will indeed deliver his people from the Philistines. In chapter 15 then, the tables are beginning to turn on the Philistine oppressors. And Israel must know this too. But the question is, does Israel care? Does Israel care? Here. 
Notice Samson's escalating war against the Philistines. Samson's escalating war against the Philistines. Notice first a devastating war, then a righteous war, and finally an unappreciated war. The catalyst which brings about this war is a series of personal affronts to Samson. Samson in chapter 15 does not act without provocation. That was also the case in chapter 14. Remember in chapter 14 that the Philistines had made a bet with Samson. The Philistines had then threatened Samson's wife who had then betrayed her and given the enemies the solution to the riddle. And in a rage, Samson had killed 30 men of Ashkelon and taken their clothing. In chapter 15, further treachery of the Philistines is evident. Because Samson appears back at Timnath seeking reconciliation with his wife. He's brought a kid, that is a young goat, as a present. His intention is to enter into the chamber to be with his wife. And his father-in-law says, in verse 2, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. This, I say, is a personal affront to Samson. And by this unlawful act, Samson's father-in-law has not only insulted Samson personally, but has insulted Israel because Samson is Israel's public representative. And Samson's response to this, this personal affront, is to destroy the Philistines' harvest. Now, if you wanted to destroy the Philistines' harvest in that day, let's say you desired to burn down all the fields of the Philistines in one night, how would you go about it? Well, Samson required skill, strength, and ingenuity for this burning of the harvest. He could not simply light one field on fire and then light another field on fire. That would take too long and the possibility would be that the Philistines would find out too early and try to stop him before he had finished the job. And so he required a method by which he could set fire to all the fields in a long, large area at once. And Samson chose the method of foxes and firebrands. Foxes and firebrands. A fox is not that animal with which we are familiar, the red fox, which is the plague of many a farmer. The fox in that day was a jackal, a small animal of the dog family, and jackals were vermin, and they hunted in packs. And a firebrand is simply a piece of wood at the end of which is some material which can be ignited on fire and is used, held aloft to give light. And so Samson used foxes and firebrands. He required 300 foxes and 150 firebrands. Now think of the organization and planning that such an attack would Require. How would you capture 300 jackals? 300 small wild dogs. You require much strength, much agility, and much speed to capture 300 jackals. 
And then you must keep them somewhere in some kind of an enclosure until you are ready to use them in your plan. At the same time, you must make 150 firebrands. You require, therefore, let's say, a bonfire. And you require lots of pieces of wood and certain amount of flammable material to put on the wood. And then Samson took pairs of jackals. He tied one jackal to another jackal by means of their tails, and he placed between their tails a firebrand, and then he sent those two jackals, those two terrified jackals, down the hill, let's say, into the fields below. He did this with 150 pairs of jackals. And again I say, no mere man, except one who has the power of God working in him by the Holy Spirit, would be able to do such a thing. And the result, of course, was devastation, because fire spread far and wide through the fields of the Philistines. It was impossible to stop these frightened, terrified jackals running hither and yon throughout all the fields of the Philistines. And so the entire harvest of the Philistines was destroyed. The wheat, the corn, the olives, the grapes, everything was ripe. Everything was ready to be harvested. Everything was dry and combustible. And the whole thing was burned up. The Bible says that the fire burned up the shocks. The shocks are the piles of grain which have already been harvested and are lying on the threshing floors. The standing corn is the ripened corn which has not yet been harvested waiting in the fields. The vineyards where the grapes were and the olives. And thus in one night... Samson destroyed everything. The Philistines lost all their crops. Now in that day, in that society, that would be a devastating loss. Because the Philistines, like the Israelites, were a society which depended upon agriculture. The harvest was the highlight of the year. If the harvest failed, that meant starvation and misery for the entire land. And now the harvest has been utterly destroyed and burned up in one night. No bread, no oil, no wine, no fruit. The necessities and luxuries of life are all ruined. And the source of income for for the land is also ruined. And so Samson in one night devastates the economy of the Philistines. And this too was a fitting judgment upon the Philistines by Jehovah God. It's interesting that all of the pagans in this day, all of them worshipped various kinds of gods who were worshipped because of the desire for fertility. You worshipped gods, Baal, Dagon, whatever god it might be, because you wanted to have a good harvest. Or you wanted to have children. The gods of fertility were unable to do anything to stop the servant of Jehovah destroying the harvest. And the Philistines had done this in the past. They had taken away the harvest of the Israelites. They had plundered what the Israelites had grown. And thus now, in fitting judgment, God takes away their harvest. And the Philistines naturally, are enraged. And they demand to know who the culprit is. Verse 6. Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, 
because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. They realize the blame for this is Samson. And they also realize that the reason Samson did this was because of the insult given to him by his father-in-law and his wife. And so they blame them and they are the ones who suffer. In fact, they're murdered. Verse 6 says, And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Remember, that's exactly what they threatened to do in the previous chapter when they threatened her about the riddle. Judges 14 verse 15. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. And now they have done exactly that. They have burnt Samson's wife and Samson's father-in-law with fire. And thus they show themselves to be, the Philistines show themselves to be a cowardly, cruel, vindictive people. And this gives Samson further excuse to destroy them. Verse 7 says, And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And Samson mercilessly destroyed the murderers of his wife and father-in-law. We don't know how many that meant. It could have been the 30 men who had been involved in the riddle in chapter 14. It may have been more. But certainly it was a devastating slaughter. Verse 5 says, He smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. And that very striking expression, with hip and thigh, means he hit them with all of his force, or he tore them limb from limb. And now the Philistines realize that their rule over the Israelites is threatened. Everything had been going smoothly for them. They had been able to oppress the Israelites without any resistance at all. And now someone has risen among this people, the Israelites, who is determined to destroy them. And they realize we need to get rid of this Samson. And so they bring a vast army to where they know Samson is living because they desire to capture him. Samson's own people deliver him into their hands and as the Philistines are about to claim victory, they shout, we're told, in verse 14, And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. Samson appears to be helpless. He has been bound by ropes by his fellow countrymen. Samson then breaks free from the ropes by the power of God and grabbing the nearest weapon that he can find, which is simply the jawbone of an ass or a donkey, he's able by the power of God again to destroy 1,000 men. And after the battle is over, Samson is lying on the ground alone, strewn with mangled corpses all around him, and he composes a poem. Heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass, have I slain a thousand men, with the jawbone of an ass. In Hebrew, the word ass and the word heap 
are very similar. A good translation could be this, with the jawbone of an ass in a mass in a mass, with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And so at the end of chapter 15, beloved, the Philistines, who had been the rulers, are devastated. For 40 years they had faced no opposition from the Israelites, and now suddenly a man rises, as it were, from nowhere, armed only with the jawbone of an ass, and destroys 1,000 of their soldiers. But the real deliverance, of course, is God. God has in his mercy raised up this man, Samson. God has sent destruction upon the Philistines. God has cut their army down to size. God has destroyed their economy. Samson appears to be unstoppable. And he is unstoppable so long as he acts by the power of God's Spirit and so long as he is faithful to God. Now what, beloved, are we to make of all of this? What are we to make of all of this violence? How are we to understand this today? Well, first we must say that these were not wicked acts of revenge, but were actually righteous acts performed out of faith in God, out of love to God's people and in service of God's covenant. This is not a private quarrel. Now, of course, the catalyst was a private quarrel, but this is not a private quarrel. This is God's war. And Samson knows this because Samson was told this by his parents that he was going to be the deliverer who would begin to deliver God's people from the Philistines. And so Samson had deliberately gone out of his way to seek occasion against the Philistines. And every time that they had provoked him to anger, he had used that as an excuse, as an occasion to attack them. Samson only destroyed their harvest because his wife was unjustly taken away from him. Samson only destroyed the Philistines' hip and thigh because they had murdered his wife and father-in-law. And Samson only destroyed 1,000 men with the jawbone of an ass because he did it in self-defense. They had come up a large army to kill him. In fact, if we could criticize Samson in chapter 15... We would say that he shows a willingness, a weakness really, to call an early truce. Verse 7 says, And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. Samson ought not to have ceased. Samson ought to have continued. It appears that Samson was happy enough to dwell alone in isolation at the top of the rock Eton and had no intention of destroying the Philistines any further until they came up against him. He does not initiate the fights. He uses them to great effect to bring God's judgment upon the Philistines. And God uses them to bring salvation to his people. Now, of course, today, and this is very important as we, as we study the Old Testament scriptures, 
Today, it would be wrong and wicked for us to vandalize our neighbor's property or to kill our neighbors in the way in which Samson does here. Remember, the Old Testament is a time of of types and shadows, physical battles, bloodshed, and the clashing of swords. We do not have that in the New Testament church. And remember also that the Philistines were not Samson's neighbors. They were Samson's enemies. They were Israel's enemies. They were God's enemies. They had no business being in the land of Canaan. And they were, as Samson calls them in verse 18, uncircumcised. Circumcision in the Old Testament was the sign of the covenant. It was the sign of friendship between Jehovah and his people. The uncircumcised in the Old Testament, they were God's enemies. And the uncircumcised had no right to occupy the land of Canaan and to oppress God's beloved people for some 40 years and therefore they were fitting objects of God's judgment. But today, our battles are not physical. We don't have a land today which we are called to defend with the sword. We're not called to use physical weapons. In fact, we may not use physical weapons in the church. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into cap- and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ." Our enemies today are not the Philistines. Our enemies today are the devil and the false church and the ungodly world and our own sinful flesh. And those enemies, beloved, are much mightier and much more dangerous than the Philistines ever were. And you cannot fight such enemies with swords or with foxes, or with firebrands, or with the jawbone of an ass. We are called today to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we are called to fight by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's great encouragement in this chapter, because the same power which worked in Samson to enable him physically to destroy the Philistines, the Holy Spirit, he is the same power today who works in us to enable us to fight against our sins and to live a godly life before the face of God. We might not think that all the time, But that's the case. Verse verse 14 says, And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord comes mightily not only upon us, but in us, and he works in us mightily to enable us to fight spiritually the spiritual weapons or rather the spiritual enemies that we have in the New Testament 
age. This battle in chapter 15 may appear to be much more exciting, but our battle against our sins is actually much more difficult. And in fact, although Samson was able to fight the Philistines, Samson was not able to fight against his own sins. Samson's weakness was his own sins. Especially we'll see that this evening, God willing. And we must not say with Samson, after that I will cease. I will fight against this error and after that I will cease. I will subdue this lust, and after that, I will cease. No, we must say, I will keep fighting. <coughs> I will never cease until I lay down my head in death, and then I enter the church triumphant. Now in this chapter also, beloved, we see that Samson fights in faith. We see that especially in his prayer toward the end of the chapter. Samson was a man who prayed. Verse 18, And he was sore athirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance, into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for th thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. Samson is exhausted. He's at the point of death. He's about to die of thirst. The exhaustion is heavy upon him. In his distress, Samson does what every child of God does in his distress. He calls upon God. This does not mean, of course, he only called upon God when he was in distress. But he, this shows us that as he fought against the Philistines, he understands that he's fighting as God's servant. He fights in that consciousness he's fighting as God's servant notice he says thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant he calls upon the God of Israel verse 18 says he called on the Lord that is Jehovah God the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob the God of the covenant, the God who made promises to his people. And Samson's great concern here is not so much for himself, but for the glory of God. He does not want to fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. Because that would bring great disgrace upon the name of the Lord. And Samson attributes his success in battle to God himself. Verse 18 again. Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And this great deliverance means this salvation. God has not simply saved Samson from this 1,000 men army. But in doing that, he has also saved Israel. That deliverance, of course, will not be complete with Samson. We know that because the angel said he will begin to deliver God's people from the Philistines. This deliverance will continue through Saul and David's day. And a true and final deliverance will not happen until Jesus Christ returns. And yet for all, all of that, we realize that the work of Samson 
is indeed the work of God. And God answers the prayer of Samson. Samson was at the point of certain death. And Samson was being led to a certain death by his own countrymen who had bound him with ropes. And were going to deliver him into the hands of his enemies. And God's spirit came mightily upon him in verse 14. And by the power of God's spirit, he broke the ropes. The Bible says that they melted. They melted. As if they were just touched by fire. This is no natural strength that Samson had. This is the power of Almighty God that came upon him. And by the power of that same spirit, he took a most unlikely weapon and he destroyed 1,000 men with it. And no doubt, beloved, those 1,000 men were well-armed military men who had swords and spears and all the rest of it. And Samson had nothing in his hand except the jawbone of an ass. And as Samson is about to die of thirst, he calls upon God. And God hears him. And by a miracle, God provides water for his servant. Verse 19. But God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he revived. Again, God owns his servant. God recognizes his servant before Israel. God acknowledges his servant. And Samson acknowledges God. He calls the place En Hakore, which means the spring of of him that called the spring of him that called but there is a very shameful thing beloved in this chapter a very shameful thing Samson is the saviour that Jehovah has raised up in mercy but Samson's own people Reject him. They reject him. They refuse to recognize him as the Savior sent by Jehovah. In fact, they see him as a liability and as an embarrassment to them. You see that in the reaction that they have to the Philistines. In verse 9 and 10. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? Why in the world have you Philistines come up against us with your vast army? They are utterly bewildered by this. Have they not been good Israelites? Have they not recognized their rightful Philistine overlords for some 40 years? Have they not faithfully paid their tribute money? And are they not still content to remain under Philistine oppression for even another 40 years, if that's what is necessary? What then would the Philistines have against them that they would come up in a camp against Judah? And the Philistines explain in verse 10 to bind Samson are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us. Your Samson he has destroyed many of our prominent men. He has destroyed our harvest. Hand him over And all will be well. And the men of Judah agree. They agree to hand over Samson to the enemy. Because they are afraid 
of the Philistines. And they're also afraid of Samson. Notice what they do in verse 11. They gather together 3,000 men. And these 3,000 men are willing, if necessary, to fight against Samson, to subdue him, to bring him to the Philistines, if he resists them. And the question is, if they have 3,000 men available for such a task, why have they not brought that 3,000 men army out against the Philistines? Why do they go against God's chosen servant instead? And why do they not thank God for raising up this Samson? And why do they not rally around this Samson and make him their captain and go forth in battle against the Philistines and drive the Philistines out? Which is what, of course, they ought to have done. But they don't. In the eyes of these men of Judah, Samson is guilty of the terrible sin of rocking the boat. He's rocking the boat. Things are peaceful between the Philistines and the Israelites. We're getting on okay. What do you have to rock the boat for? You're spoiling the good relations we have with our Philistine neighbours. And notice what they say to Samson in verse 11. Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? Don't you know that, Samson? And then they say, what is this that thou hast done unto us? You've done this to us. You're ruining everything for us. They don't see this as a deliverance from God. As mercy from God. No. You're ruining our little peaceful life that we had. And we're here, Samson, to bind you with ropes and to bring you down the hill and to hand you over to the Philistines and they can do with you what they want. They can even kill you if they want. But we're going to get rid of you because you have become a liability to us. And that's the case in the church world today. Let a man raise his voice in defense of the truth of God. Let a man raise his voice to attack the lie of the devil. And there will be the same reaction from the false church and from the compromising church. What have you done to us? You're rocking the boat. We Christians have been living in peaceful coexistence with the world. We have been living in peaceful coexistence with what we would call the false church. And now you're going to ruin it by your speeches and your pamphlets and your website and your books and your sermons. This happened some years ago in Limerick. Your minister, Reverend Stewart, came down to Limerick and gave a speech about Mary, about the Virgin Mary. And the reaction was, you just came down here to cause trouble. We've got a good relationship, Roman Catholics and Protestants in this part of the world. We've got ecumenism going here. You're ruining everything. And so they rejected what he had to say. That's often the case with the compromising Christian. He can become so enslaved and blinded by his own sins and his compromise with the world that he does not 
welcome someone coming to deliver him from that. He wants to live in this false, ungodly, carnal, destructive peace. And that's also what happened to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came along and he, in the eyes of the Pharisees, he rocked the boat. He rocked the boat. And they said, we have to get rid of him. Because if we don't, the people will turn to him and the Romans will come and destroy our city and take away our nation. And so he's a liability. He must be sacrificed for the good of the nation. That was the case with Samson too. Samson must be sacrificed for the good of the nation. If we get rid of Samson, then we can keep on living in peace with the Philistines. And Samson meekly submits to this indignity. He allows himself to be tied up with ropes. As long as they promise not to kill him themselves because he does not want to shed the blood of his own people. He's loyal to his own people. Even though they're not loyal to him. And then he comes down the hill. By the power of God he breaks the ropes. By the power of God he destroys and scatters the Philistine army. And there he lies all alone on that hill dying of thirst and where are his people where are the Israelites do they come to congratulate him to thank him for the deliverance he has brought to them no they're not there do they come even with some, some water to give to him no they don't care they then die of thirst it's better for us if he dies of thirst and so Israel shows here that they are utterly unworthy of the salvation which God brings to them. Israel actually loved the Philistines. And they hated Samson. They loved their bondage to sin. They were used to it. They were comfortable with it. In fact, they were frightened by the very idea of freedom from it. And that's true of us too. By nature, that's true of us. Rather than be saved from sin, we would rather kill the Saviour. That's what Israel did. That's what God's people did when Christ himself came. And that's what we would do too. And the wonderful miracle of salvation is beloved. That that's exactly what God planned to happen. God sent his son to be the saviour. Knowing that he would be rejected. It was necessary that the saviour be rejected. So that he could die upon a cross. And having died upon a cross, he delivered his people from all of their sins. And that shows us, beloved, the glory of his grace. Because the worse the background of our sin, the more glorious the grace of God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee that thou dost give to us a saviour. We confess that we are not worthy of him. We pray that thou wilt make us thankful for him. Enable us to live a life which is holy in thy sight. And keep us from evil for Christ's sake. Amen.